It's really my pleasure to introduce um, our very special guest, the Honorable Dr. David Shulkin. Dr. Shulkin has served as the Undersecretary for Health for the Department of Veterans Affairs since June 2015. In this position, he acts as the Chief Executive of the nation's largest integrated healthcare system. Dr. Shulkin has an esteemed professional resume, which includes serving as President and CEO of Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City, and Chief Medical Officer of three hospitals, and the University of Pennsylvania Health System. As an entrepreneur, he founded and served as the Chairman and CEO of Dr. Quality, one of the first consumer-oriented resources of information for quality and safety in healthcare. Dr. Shulkin has been named one of the top 100 physician leaders of hospitals and healthcare systems by Becker's Hospital Review, and as one of the 50 most influential physician executives in the country. I've been um, had the pleasure to work with Dr. Shulkin over the last several months and since he's been here, um, and I'm telling you, he is a breath of fresh air and was so pleased that he took his time today. I know he's uh, traveling, coming straight from another trip, but I thought it was so important for you to hear directly from VA, his vision um, as the Undersecretary for Health, what they're doing, what progress has been made. You heard from Mr. Gibson this morning. I think this will round out our presentation really well in what we're going to be talking about. So Dr. Shulkin, please join us. Give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm really, uh, really pleased to be here today and so glad that all of you uh, came this morning. Um, I can't tell you how important it is that um, you're doing the work that you're doing and that you're here to advocate on behalf of veterans. Um, coming into VA at this time with so many people targeting us and, and uh, so much attention that is often not positive, knowing that you're there, understanding the work that we're doing, advocating on behalf of veterans, I can't tell you how important that is. And so I just really want to not only uh, recognize, but congratulate and thank all of you at, at DAV for the work that you're doing. And uh, giving you a chance to sort of update you on what's going on in VA, I think it's going to be important. Uh, I'm going to move through this very quickly because it's very hard to tell you all the things that are happening in VA uh, in a short period of time. But as Joy said, uh, I had the privilege to join VA about seven months ago. Um, I had not really been in the VA healthcare system for about 25 or maybe even 30 years when I first did my residency in VA. This is the uh, day that Secretary Gibson actually uh, signed me in in July of last year. Uh, and it's been a very different experience for me coming from the private sector into VA. In fact, uh, the irony is I used to joke when I would run hospitals as the CEO around the country, uh, I used to say, what's it going to take to get this done in the hospital, an act of Congress? And uh, it actually turns out that now I say that a lot because almost everything that we do really literally takes an act of Congress. Um, <clears throat> But one of the unique things that I have that maybe past undersecretaries haven't had is that I do get to compare the difference between what the VA healthcare system does compared to the private sector. And quite frankly, uh, when I came into the system not knowing as much about the VA, haven't, haven't had really worked there in 25, 30 years, um, I guess I did wonder, you know, well, shouldn't we just privatize the VA? You know, I sort of had a an open mind, but I will tell you after being here now over seven months and actually practicing in the VA taking care of veterans, that's where, that's where I was coming from on my trip, I was seeing patients. Um, I can tell you that what we do in the VA healthcare system is very different than what happens in the private sector and cannot be easily replicated and would be a big disaster for veterans and for the country to simply throw this uh, system out. So what I have begun to speak about and actually writing about in national journals are the things that happen in the VA healthcare system that are completely different than what happens in the private sector. And so you can see on this chart here, um, you know, the private sector doesn't provide, and I know what DAV does in terms of this transportation, it doesn't provide support for caregivers. If you don't have a home 
uh, no one in the private sector is going to go out and work to find you a home. The integration of behavioral health with primary care, completely different. Um, the single EMR platform that we have, completely different than what you find in the private sector. So it's very important to remind the country about this. And in fact, particularly for veterans, um, if we were just to send people out into the community, you can see from these studies that very few practitioners out in the community actually understand what people who have served this country have gone through. Just one in five having any type of cultural competency about military service. Only 13% of those in the mental health field in the community really can speak about military or deployment issues or use the types of therapies that work so much. And so the more that I've gotten to know the VA, understand not only how we treat veterans differently clinically, but the fact that we train 70% of the doctors in this country through the VA healthcare system, the fact that we are doing research, the only organization that's doing research to specifically help and improve veteran health, this is an organization that quite frankly, I don't think can or should be uh, replaced by the private sector. Um, the other thing that you don't really get a sense about until you join the VA and have a chance to visit places around the country like I do as the undersecretary, uh, you get to see the way that our culture and traditions get carried on that I think is so important and makes it so special. This is actually a picture from a trip that I took to the North Chicago site where um, it's called the final salute. I don't know how many of you have ever seen this, but in hospitals, again, where I've spent my career, when a patient passes away, they typically, as you see on TV, will drape a white sheet over them and wheel them in a stretcher down the hall uh, to the morgue, which is always at the far end of the hospital in the basement. And watching uh, you know, a patient with a white sheet draped over their sheet just being wheeled down the hall can be pretty depressing for other patients who are in the hospital. So what they do in the VA now is, is instead of using a white sheet, they drape the stretcher with a, with a US flag. And people line up, you can see here, to give what's the final salute as, as the veteran gets to be wheeled down. So it's turned into a respect and, and honor tradition rather than one that is, is depressing. And I just think it really speaks to uh, how the VA is different, how it treats veterans different. I think uh, many of you who have been involved with DAV for years understands that the VA actually provides some extraordinary care. Uh, this is Phil Longman's book where he, he, you know his story where, where um, he was hired by one of the national magazines to go out and to do a featured story on uh, find the very best healthcare system in the country and we want to feature them on the, front, on the front cover of our magazine. So he went out to do his research. He came back to the editors and said, I found the best healthcare system. They said, that's great, where is it? He said, it's the VA healthcare system. They said, you're an idiot, you're fired. And they literally fired him. So he went out and um, wrote a book about this and, and um, actually documented years and years ago, because I think the book's been out almost a decade now, about the very best outcomes in the country uh, what's interesting is, is that these same findings are being shown as we speak today. This was from the Journal of the American Medical Association two weeks ago, their featured study that basically showed that the mortality rates in VA hospitals for conditions like acute myocardial infarction and congestive heart failure are superior to those in the private sector. So really the same exact findings that Philip Longman wrote about in his book have been replicated time and time again and last to this day that we just simply are doing a better job than many of the private sector hospitals are doing. Um, one of the reasons why we do, we, are, we have the best analytics. We can study what we're doing better than almost any healthcare system in the country. And again, this is a field I've been in a long time. This is what we call our sale performance where you can actually see how we're doing in every metric and we're pretty transparent. We publish this data you can see that the VA healthcare system overall is improving dramatically year to year. We're, we're getting better. That's what you would hope our organization would do, focusing on things that we can do better and actually implementing performance improvement. 
and you can see everything on the right side in the blue, the yellow, the green is better. If it's red, it means that that's the opportunity that we have to continue to improve on and get better on. So we're not, we're not where we need to be, but this is an organization that every day is getting stronger and better. And we have a lot of people helping us. Uh, to the last count that I had, 137 external groups giving us reports and recommendations. Every single thing that we do is under the microscope uh, and people telling us about, about how we can do a better job. So when I came into the organization, knowing that there's so much public scrutiny, obviously knowing the reason I'm here is because there was a crisis in the VA healthcare system, primarily started with our wait time crisis. I established five priorities for the health system that we're focused on. The first is to fix the access issues. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. The second is to fix our employee issues to make sure that this is a place that people want to come to work, feel supported, and we can fill our key positions. The third is to implement best practices. The fourth is, is to develop what I call a high performance network, which I know DAV is, um, has some very, very good ideas on. And the last and probably most important is to restore the trust among veterans in the VA healthcare system and the American public to have confidence in what we're doing. So I know we have some work to do there. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the progress we've been making um, and then have you make up your mind whether we're headed in the right direction. Of course, the wait time crisis, the access issue starting in Phoenix in April 2014 really put the VA into its current state of crisis. But this was not a access crisis that happened in 2014. This had been building for years and years and years. And in fact, I can go back and find reports from 15 years ago that predicted that this was gonna happen and all these uh, events were going on because no one had taken the appropriate steps to make the systematic impacts or improvements that you need to to make sure that we're taking care of veterans in a timely fashion. This is actually just data showing that if we just asked veterans themselves, these are our patient satisfaction scores, you can see the veterans themselves were telling us that there was a problem going on well, well before the, the crisis in Phoenix. <clears throat> Having said that, um, we do have a issue and I will show you how we're fixing it. But I do want to remind people, so does the rest of healthcare. I mean, all of you know, if you try to go out to your community doctors, and again, this has been my business for 30 years, uh, people in the community have a tough time getting in to see the doctors they need when they want to get them. And so if you ask veterans and you ask non-veterans whether they have trouble getting care, you can see veterans actually think they have better, better access to health care than most non-veterans. Um, this is highly geographic as we know, but, but most of the country is struggling with these same issues. When I first got to VA and I began to start asking some questions about the wait time issues, it amazed me that no one had actually separated out veterans who were waiting for urgent care, things that couldn't wait. I have a tumor in my chest versus routine care, which is I'm going back to see my primary care doctor for my six month checkup. VA had not ever separated that. We kept every veteran waiting in a single large list. And so the first thing that I did was, which I thought was just really basic uh, healthcare management, I separated veterans into those that needed care urgently from routine care. And as soon as I got my list of 57,000 veterans waiting for urgent care consults, we held within two weeks what we called a national stand down. We opened up every medical center across the country on a Saturday and we said, we're not gonna stop till we take care of every one of those 57,000 patients waiting for urgent care, whether it means bring them in that day to the emergency room, whether it means get them to see a doctor in the community that day. And by the end of the day, we had taken the list of 57,000 down to 55,000. And today that list is less than a couple hundred veterans. The reason why it still is a couple hundred veterans, we had wrong phone numbers, people moved, people died, reasons that we can't get in touch with those veterans. Um, and you can see that we kept sustainability on the number of patients that have urgent care needs being seen right away uh, after that stand down, down to a low level. So today 
we're never going to get back to the 55,000. This is a much, much smaller number of sustainable impacts on, on consults. Now, this doesn't mean the wait lists for veterans go away. You may have to wait a longer time to get eyeglasses, audiograms, uh, non-urgent issues, but our first priority is take care of people who are sick, who can't afford to wait, and that's where the VA is now focused. We are implementing this year, in 2016, same-day access across the country for primary care and for mental health issues. So uh, this is not for every issue that you'll have same-day access, but if you need to get in to see a primary care doctor and you're having an urgent issue that day, by the end of 2016, every medical center in the country is committing to having same-day access. We have about 50 medical centers out of 150 today that have same-day access. I can tell you where I was practicing this, um, this weekend, they have same-day access. I was there in walk-in clinic. Any veteran who needed to be seen in Manhattan could be seen that day. Uh, we need to get that across the country, and we will do that by the end of the year. Uh, we are implementing what we call seamless access, which means if you normally get your care in St. Louis, but you're traveling and you're in Florida or you're in um, another part of the country, you should be able to walk in and get your care at any VA medical center because you're a veteran, not here, oh, well, your, your uh, home uh, clinic is in St. Louis. You have to contact them. So by the end of the year, we will have implemented a seamless system, not only for prescriptions, but for all medical care across the country so you can feel safe wherever you travel, that you have uh, the VA healthcare system behind you. Uh, for those who say, well, what's the VA been doing since, since the crisis? We really have been working hard to uh, get more appointments available. You can see by measuring the workload of every VA doctor and clinician, we are up 10% since the crisis happened. So we've just been improving productivity of the average doctor, having them see more patients and having more hours. This is equated to 20 million additional provider hours of care throughout the system. We are growing our telehealth capabilities, particularly for veterans who have to travel a lot. You can see we now have the largest telehealth system in the country, and that's something that we're continuing to invest in and to grow. Um, we are learning from one another now across the system. Believe it or not, we had not been doing a lot of sharing about what worked in California with what's working on the East Coast. Now we are implementing sharing of best practices. We've actually held our first Shark Tank. Do all of you watch Shark Tank on uh, ABC? I'm not doing a plug for them, but it's, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite shows. So we actually held a Shark Tank where we got every VA to submit their best practices, their best ideas. We actually had sharks bidding on them, and now we have a number of best practices that we're committing to spread out consistently across the country so that we are learning from one another and making sure when we learn something's working that we're implementing it consistently throughout the VA healthcare system. And we're bringing new innovations uh, to not only VA and the country. We just uh, had an announcement two weeks ago that one of our researchers has uh, developed a non-addictive medication for pain that hopefully can replace opioids. And everyone knows about the real issues that we have in this country about people being addicted to their prescription medications and this really taking over their life. So this would be a major advance, something that we're really working on on pain management. Uh, we're also using new technology. You can see this is one of the new kiosks that we're looking to um, put in certain areas across the country, particularly rural areas, where you could just walk into a shopping mall or some area where we don't have a facility walk in and using telehealth be able to get your physical exam right in that kiosk. So you can see how using new technology, new ideas, we can bring VA care closer to where people live, not have to have them travel hours and hours and uh, be able to get the type of care they need. We are uh, <clears throat> developing new ways of identifying veterans who are at risk for suicide using large data sets and predictive analytics, being able to identify who's at risk so we don't have to consistently just wait and hear about terrible things that have happened. And this is uh, data that's coming out of the VA healthcare system. Uh, osteo integration, we performed our first uh, in the country osteo integration surgery at Salt Lake City's VA about three weeks ago. This is where if you need an amputation, uh, we actually build the, um, <coughs> the uh, device right into your 
bone in your skin so that you can actually get a much better feel when you walk and you use the device and it's much easier to switch devices in and out. Uh, you can see that the, that's the metal bar being put right into there. So it's, it's like a Lego piece where you can actually put your prosthetic right into it, snap it off, snap it on. And this is the first time this has been done in the country, but we think it will become a standard of care in the years to come. And finally, what I want to just talk about a little bit is about where the VA health care system is going. It's what I call a high performance network. Um, and this is really how do we work with the VA health care system and doctors and hospitals in the community to serve veterans best. Um, I think it would be a huge mistake to say that VA needs to trim down its services, that VA needs to begin to withdraw providing services to veterans. I think that, if anything, we need to make sure the things that we're doing in the VA are world class and we need to begin to put more resources into them. But when we work with the community, particularly in our choice program, right now we are not making sure that veterans are going to the very best doctors. We're essentially sending veterans out to whatever doctors are signing up in the system. And that's not the way I believe that we should be doing this. So, so what a high performance network is, is actually monitoring the quality and the outcomes of veterans within the VA system, which we're doing great, but now expanding that to be able to monitor the outcomes and the quality when veterans go outside the VA healthcare system. And actually having a, a, a command center that's able to track the outcomes of veterans, much like NASA tracks the um, the rockets when they send them up into space because we now have the ability to do that. And what it ends up resulting in is our ability to make sure veterans are getting the best care anywhere. So if they have to leave a VA in Birmingham, Alabama, we now have data that suggests that on this, if you can see the small print, this says that the very best place to go in Birmingham would be Walker Baptist Medical Center and the very worst place to go would be right below at the Baptist Medical Center in Princeton. And so what a high performance network begins to do, it allows us at VA to use our large data sets to tell veterans where they can get the very best outcomes, the highest quality care, when they should be using VA for that high quality care, when there's actually better outcomes outside the VA, how they could use it. And our role becomes to coordinate the care for veterans no matter where they're getting that care within the VA healthcare system or when they have to go out of the VA healthcare system. But that's a very different message than saying that we need to trim back on the VA or we need to privatize the VA. I think that would be the wrong decision. But we have a duty to make sure that when a veteran does have to go out the v uh, outside of the VA healthcare system, we know that they're getting the very best care and we can make sure that their care is coordinated with the doctors who are within the VA healthcare system. Uh, I did want to just end on these last two slides. The most important thing, our currency is not to make money in the VA healthcare system. Our currency is to earn the trust and confidence of veterans and of the American public. And the way I believe that, we're, that we need to do that is to be open and transparent about everything we're doing, the things we're doing well. I hope I've shared some of those with you today, but also the things that we're not doing well and that we need to get better in. And I'm a pretty strong advocate for telling it like it is. If there are areas that we're not, we're not serving veterans well, I certainly want to hear about it and I am not at all ambivalent about sharing that with people in my organization that we have to do better. Um, we have to staff our critical positions with the right people. Today I have 34 medical centers without a director, without a medical center director. Uh, I don't know how you can restore confidence and trust if you don't have the right people leading your organization. So that's one of the things which I'll mention on my last slide that we could use your help with. Um, we also need stability for our leadership positions and with our physicians. The single thing that loses a veteran's trust is when their doctor leaves the VA healthcare system or when there's constant turnover. Uh, veterans want these long relationships with the people caring for them and we have to do things to keep our doctors and our leaders uh, making sure that VA is a great place to deliver care. And we have to make sure that we're empathetic. Too often I'm hearing stories um, about the inconsistency in the way that veterans experience their healthcare providers. And so we have to reemphasize this is a system 
that is here to serve. Uh, we have to embrace servant leadership and empathy in what we do. So lastly, just asking for your help. Um, the, as you go out to speak to members of Congress, uh, and I know Deputy Secretary Gibson talked to you about this this morning, from my perspective in the health system, the things that we really need the most help for is we need Congress to allow us to be able to spend money for veterans, for care in the community with more flexibility. We have money, but they're in these very, very rigid um, pockets of money, like checking accounts, and I can't use one uh, in one account to help spend in the other account, and it makes the system complex to use, difficult to understand, and doesn't benefit veterans. So we're asking for flexibility of that funding, and we've given them some proposals. Provider agreements allows us to go out and contract with doctors and hospitals in the community or nursing homes that are the highest quality nursing homes or doctors or hospitals. And we need the ability to contract with them with what's called provider agreements to get the job done. We don't have that today. Lastly, uh, the last two, the physicians, uh, we, we are only allowed to pay a doctor 40 hours a week um, in current federal laws. Many doctors now are becoming what are called hospitalists or they work in emergency rooms that have shifts that work more than 40 hours a week. So we're becoming non-competitive as an employer because the private sector can allow them to work 60 hours one week and 10 hours the next week. We can't do that. So we need, we need the ability to work outside the 40 hour work week for doctors. And lastly, uh, to be able to fill our spots, our leadership spots in medical centers, those 34 medical centers that today I don't have anybody running them, um, we need what's called Title 38 funding. It allows us to be more market competitive for these positions like the private sector. And I can tell you, I'm having a tough time finding people to want to take these jobs because the private sector is hiring them away from us. So we need that type of flexibility. And again, I very, very much appreciate your support and advocacy on our behalf, and thank you for everything you're doing on behalf of veterans. Thank <laughs> you.